Okay, so uh, hello everyone. Welcome to uh, this session uh, of our ARC uh, working group. Uh, so today uh, we are very happy to uh, have uh, with us uh, Sasha Romanowski from uh, Round, uh, who is an expert in uh, cyber risk and uh, in the study of cyber insurance. And so uh, we are very uh, happy to uh, hear what he's uh, going to tell us. Uh, so let's recall that during the, the presentation, uh, to avoid some uh, disconnection, uh, usually we stop uh, the, the camera except for, for, for Sasha. Uh, and then feel free, of course, to ask uh, all the questions that you want uh, in, uh, in the chat. Uh, and there will be also uh, room for question in the end. So uh, Sasha, thank you again for, for being here virtually and uh, the, the virtual floor is yours right now. Thank you. Hi everyone, um, very nice to be here. Uh, apologies in advance for not being able to uh, give this presentation in French. Uh, there was a point when I was bilingual, but uh, being born and raised in Canada, uh, but it has been a while since I've used it. So I will carry on in English and happy to answer any questions uh, along the way or afterwards. So, yeah. Uh, so uh, what I will present is some research I did um, a few years ago. It's not, it's, not, um, uh, it's not terribly old, but I believe still very relevant um, on uh, from the examination of a batch of cyber insurance policies here in the US. And so uh, we were able to collect these policies because of state laws that require that insurance commissioners, uh, the agencies that, that quasi regulate the industries, allow these policies uh, to be publicly available. So these are not signed policies. These are not the actual policies that I don't see the signatures and the dollar amounts from these policies. What I see are, are the raw templates, the files that are submitted to insurance commissioners for evaluation. They want to make sure the prices and conditions are appropriate for their customers. So we collected a bunch of those policies and did some analysis that I'll share with you. Um, there was additional work that we did to look at the cost of these incidents, the cost of cyber incidents. Um, and that is very relevant in this world because if if the cost of these breaches and these violations is very high, then that drives uh, real policy interventions, and that suggests that people really need to take action to to, to stop this, to you know, um, uh, maybe hold firms liable or compensate victims. Uh, but on the other hand, if the costs aren't very large, then you know, maybe that suggests there should be other interventions or other directions that we should apply um, our resources. So there is an outstanding question of really how expensive are these incidents? And it's a bit of a reality check. And so some of the results may surprise you. And then I'll talk a little bit at the end uh, about some new data collected uh, again here in the US about the profitability of uh, cyber, the cyber insurance line. And that is actually quite startling. So uh, let us start. <clears throat> so here, again, here in the US, and, and I think it's true in, in most places in the world now, um, policymakers at the federal level are, are recognizing that cyber incidents, um, data breaches, privacy violations, and all kinds of, sort of related cyber issues are really impacting firms in, in many different ways, small, medium, and large sized businesses. And they are always, these different federal regulators are looking to find interventions, um, policy devices to reduce sort of this, these harms. We wanna understand what the harm is, the magnitude of the harm, but we also wanna reduce it. So here in the US, um, uh, th there have been some efforts to create a, a security framework. So NIST is a, a part of a, a federal agency that creates standards and they have written some very good documents describing and outline um, 
uh, a set of, of procedures, let's call it, that they call the cybersecurity framework. So if you are a company and you're not sure what security controls to apply to your organization, then these frameworks, uh, these risk management frameworks are very useful for understanding what is the scope of things. It's not gonna tell you exactly what to do, um, but it provides a, a, a list of, of guidelines. Uh, and cyber insurance always comes up when we talk about heavy handed regulation or liability, uh, allowing people to sue companies. Um, the notion of cyber insurance is always introduced as a potential solution to all of this. Uh, but here, from what I have seen, the discussion is not very, let's say, sophisticated, honestly. Um, people think that or maybe automatically assume that if there is insurance, if there is sufficient insurance, then that will automatically make firms behave in appropriate ways. Um, but, but that should not be a foregone conclusion. The discussions that I have seen never go very deep into explaining why and how that should happen. Why, on the, what are the conditions under which that will occur? And what are the uh, potential pitfalls that may happen? So first of all, what we don't want is for firms to substitute better security practices with insurance, right? This is the familiar moral hazard problem. We don't want them to think that, oh, because I have insurance, I don't need to apply these different security controls and take measures. That is a legitimate problem, uh, but there are solutions. Uh, and of course, the other issue is from a carrier's point of view, an insurance carrier's point of view, or a reinsurer for that matter, you want to be able to, through whatever practice of fancy data collection or surveys or interviews or whatever, to be able to assess risk, cyber risk, um, but also to differentiate among firms. And I think that differentiation is arguably the more important part of it. The risk analysis itself will have measurement error, right? We're never going to get this perfect because in fact, we as a community don't know how to do that effectively, cyber risk assessment. We try and we have metrics and we create scenarios, um, but we just don't know how to do it. We're not that sophisticated. Uh, so there's always going to be measurement error. But even if there is measurement error, if you are consistent in your analysis across firms, hopefully uh, you are able to differentiate the risk and be able to understand where and how one firm poses a greater risk than the other. And I think that's important. Anyhow, so with that backdrop, we wanted to understand this market because as of a number of years ago, it was not clear how cyber insurance uh, worked. Really, what were the policies? What did they look like? What did they cover? What did they exclude? And fundamentally, how did carriers assess cyber risk? How did they price cyber risk? Um, these were always the, the, the whispers the, of the underlying conversations in conferences and workshops of what characteristics of a firm are used to assess its risk. Just like with medical insurance, we want to know your age, uh, your gender, if you are a smoker, if you exercise, what are the analogies with firms? And we, we never had good information about that. Uh, so currently, as you as you may know, uh, the total premiums in the U.S. Uh, around four billion dollars um, annually, um, which is is significant. Um, it's not the twenty billion dollars that people thought it might be, but it is growing over time, and so maybe eventually it will get there. Um, it is important to put that in context though. So of all corp when we think of all corporate insurance, directors and officers, general liability, proper, other property and casualty, all the excess, all the umbrella, all these other policies, cyber insurance makes up a very small part of it. So that, that's important, but it's still in the billions of dollars and that's important. Um, these numbers may be a bit off from a number of years ago, uh, but you can think of premiums in the tens of thousands of dollars with limits in the tens of millions of dollars. And certainly companies can build towers of insurance into the hundreds, hundreds of millions of dollars. Now, uh, we'll talk about how that might be changing uh, lately, but this 
this gives you some sense of, of what's going on. And so what we did was to collect um, close to 200 different insurance policies, sort of dockets, um, from a number of states within the United States. So we looked at the larger states where we would expect to find uh, the most variation and the most sort of comprehensive sets of policies. So here in the US, that's New York, it's California and uh, Pennsylvania. And so we collected policies from 2007 to 2017. Um, of those policies, it's a bit of a, of a mess when you try and do this data collection. You're not always sure what you're going to find. Um, so of all of these policies, we went through, through hundreds and hundreds of documents um, to pull out the bits and pieces that were most useful. So 69 of those policies related to the coverage and exclusion, 44 related to the security questionnaires. So as you would imagine, in the process of underwriting, carriers are looking to, again, the assess the risk of the companies and what is one way they do that? Well, they provide them questionnaires to, to ask them um, how consumer, employer, personal information do you have about users? Um, what kind of information? How many networking devices do you have? What is your attack surface? Um, uh, do you have policies to address um, uh, sort of acceptable use practices by your employees? Do you have proper firewalls and encryption and two-factor authentication and on and on and on and on? And there's been a whole evolution of these questionnaires, but ostensibly these questionnaires can be useful to, to measure that cyber risk, to get a sense of how sophisticated, how mature these companies are. Anyhow. And then we found close to 100 rate schedules. So the rate schedules are what we were really after. So these are the equations, literally the equations um, that drive the premiums. And so we'll, we'll take a look at those. So quickly, uh, many of you may be very aware of this, but for those who aren't, um, these policies are initially designed to cover business interruption. Uh, in the case of a network outage, uh, either by malicious attack or sort of some other event, if your website is offline for a number of days, you want to you want to recover the uh, any revenue lost. But if an if and when an incident does happen, you need to engage in many activities to figure out what went wrong and how to restore uh, your business to normal operations. So there's forensic review. Maybe it's hiring companies, um, other experts, external experts to uh, to investigate what happened um, to, to conduct their forensic investigations and 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 provide you information. Um, here in the States, breach disclosure is required under many situations um, to affected users, to affected customers. So if a company is breached, if their information is lost, then the companies need to notify. So this is an extra cost incurred. Other monitoring expenses. Um, so in the event of financial information, identity theft, um, uh, sort of services are, are, are made available to affected users public relations and the cost of claims and penalties and, and all these kinds of things are, are typically covered. In some cases, ransomware is covered, but now things are changing, And but that's another story. Um, acts of terrorism and acts of war sometimes are um, included under kind of a small set of situations, but generally excluded. Right, uh, but the act of war, of course, is a is a big issue. It's currently being litigated here in the U.S., and, and I suspect it is um, also a contentious issue throughout the rest of the world. Predominantly because of recent, well, uh, three years ago, the rant, the um, WannaCry, and the NotPetya incidents really brought that to bear, um, or brought that to the forefront. So criminal acts commonly excluded. Um, and these are typically copied and pasted across different insurance lines. So there's nothing exceptional here. Um, but the idea is that if the losses to the company were the result of some kind of criminal act by agents of that company, then these losses won't be covered, so which, is, which is fair. Um, uh, and in some cases, in, in fact, there is one, only one case where we saw any kind of mention of an exclusion due to improper or sort of negligent practices by the company. This would seem like a useful um, condition to have in a policy, that if you are extremely risky, 
uh, behave in extreme risk kind of way, risky kind of way, then no, we're not going to cover your losses. Um, but we only we only found that in in one case. I suppose I should have moved that last bullet point over. Uh, in some senses, collateral damage. So if there's if your system is used is hacked to then attack someone else, that third party loss in a sense or fourth party loss will not be will not be covered. And so to these questionnaires, again, you can think of, you know, an insurance carrier wants to know sort of everything that they can um, or everything that would provide them some measure of the security posture, the resilience, the safety of a company and its networks in terms of policies and procedures, the technical stuff, the legal stuff, the organizational stuff. And so there are many questions that we could potentially ask. Uh, and they certainly try, uh, but the reality is that we don't know. We as security professionals, we as researchers, we as practitioners just don't know. I can't even tell you, I've been at this in the security world for a while, even I can't tell you what is the most complete, the smallest but most complete set of questions to ask a company to properly assess its, its risk. Um, and so we guess, right? We, we do the best we can. Um, uh, and so, as you might imagine, there are questions about uh, what are the practices for collecting data, if that is the, the information that is most often compromised, stolen, uh, held for ransom. Uh, what amount of information do you have on customers? Um, what kinds of information is it date of birth? Is it passport information? Is, is it financial? Is it medical? Whatever. Uh, what kind of outsourcing or third party practices or companies do you, uh, do you work with? Uh, what has been your past history of breaches or of incidents? What is the amount of spending that you have uh, sort of relative to other spending in this area? And then obviously questions in the technical area about sort of access control and firewalls, encryption, um, two-factor authentication, um, uh, edge routing sort of behaviors and patch management and all of that kind of stuff. And then in the legal world, um, there's a sort of an understanding and awareness of what other, what other um, uh, procedures and restrictions and regulations that does this company need to comply with because that may sort of affect their underlying uh, risk and security posture. And then Paul, and then there are questions about about policies and procedures. Do you have do you have security policies you know sort of written for your technical uh, um, technical policies and for the users uh, the users in your companies are these reviewed every year? Is there someone accountable for this and for that? And the questions go on and on. They started off, uh, as I understand, they started off uh, being you know, 15, 20 pages long, very, very detailed. Carriers really wanted to know and collect as much information as they could, understandably. But because of market pressures by companies, uh, companies don't want to answer those questions. Um, and even if they could, it's not clear that you would get very useful information that the right person would be answering. Um, so after years, those those questionnaires condensed a little bit into a few pages. But again, now we may see them expanding again as carriers try to look for more information. <clears throat> okay, so the um, gist of this, the important part is, uh, well, at least from our research point of view, is how do carriers price risk? So the word I have here is suboptimally, um, but that is maybe a generous term. The, you know, the real answer is not very well. They don't really have any idea. Uh, now they're, I'll confess, they are getting better and that's fine, but at the beginning they don't know. And so as I collected these, these policies, we also found information explanations by the, by the carriers to these insurance commissioners uh, again, justifying their prices and rates, and some carriers would would provide these these very nice nice descriptions. So they would say, for instance, limitations of available data have constrained the traditional actuarial methods used to support rates, which I think is a is a beautiful way of of, of saying that we have no idea, <laughs> we have no idea what we're doing, um, we are making this up. 
Um, maybe we collected some information from uh, industry reports about loss frequency and, uh, and magnitude, uh, but basically we don't know. Um, sometimes they would say that they, uh, they, they, they measured it or provided a loose loose guidelines or because it's side based on the size of the company, the relative size of each insured. So <clears throat> not very empirical. Um, or they might say that, look, we, we looked at this other company, we looked at their policy, they seem to be, be doing things reasonably. So we're just going to copy that information, um, which I actually I understand is, is, uh, is, is commonly done in the insurance world. I, I didn't know that, but apparently it's, it, it, it happens. That kind of plagiarism is, is just fine. Which, Seems fine. Um, in other cases, they would base uh, the policies on other insurance lines that they thought had similar loss distributions. So uh, the directors and officers or professional liability or errors in admission, um, you know, they figure might have similar kinds of distributions. And so why not just kind of copy that? Maybe the hazard tables by industries are similar. Um, and maybe we have these kind of extreme events um, also, but, you know, by and large, you know, why not? Let's take that as a starting point and, and move on. So, <clears throat> and so what we found was after going through the actual equations, the right schedules themselves, we found three different, let's call them groupings or approaches to estimating prices. So I'll walk you through those. The first is just a flat rate. So based on whatever industry reports or analysis have been done, they come up with some number for a frequency of event as a percentage, some estimate of the loss, and uh, you know add on a, a, a profit loading and come up with a premium. So these policies here uh, were geared for small companies. So they come up they come up with a number of one hundred and fifty three dollars or two hundred and twenty seven dollars, and it's really nothing more sophisticated than that, and that's just cost of these policies for all firms within within this range. Uh, the other is, is the base rate, which again, many of you are, might be very familiar with. <clears throat> um, this was new and very exciting to me, by the way. I, I had no idea at this point when I was studying this, how any of this worked. And so it was, it was a gold mine to find this kind of information. Anyway, so the base rate approach is to, is to group by asset size, by ranges of asset size, create a table like this that you see on the left. Um, and to say, look, the base premium for a company with between two and a half and five billion dollars is going to be sixteen thousand five hundred dollars. That's just the base rate. Now, what do we do from that? Well, uh, if the if the policy applicant wants to increase the limits, and so that would be for a default limit of a million dollars in coverage. But if they want to raise the limit to say $5 million, then we would multiply the $16,500 by 2.987. And that's just what you do. If they wanted $25 million, they would multiply the $16,500 by almost nine. And, and then we just continue. And, and this approach is really just a linear product of these different factors. So 16 and a half thousand times whatever limit multiplier times um, an industry multiplier. So through whatever means this carrier has um, created these hazard tables by industry and they have identified that accounting companies um, are less risky. And so the multiplier for them is 0.85. On the other hand, uh, medical or health related services pose a greater risk, either because of their poor practices or increased target or threat. Uh, and so the multiplier for them is 1.2. And so you can see how this carries on and on and on and on. So any number greater than one is going to increase the, um, the premium, any number less is going to decrease it. And then the third, and so that may be it. So for that second approach, that is all that's done. There is no other information. Um, that's incorporated about the firm. Now, there may be other interview through other interview process and sort of other measures, um, other adjustments that are done to the policy. But as far as the official um, statement by the carrier about how they do this, um, 
this is what they describe. So now the third approach, which is arguably more sophisticated um, and perhaps more accurate, hopefully more accurate, is to take that base rate approach. And now we start to apply other factors that do um, speak to the security posture of the company. So here, do you have an information system security policy? Is it maintained? Um, uh, is the information policy kept current and reviewed at least annually? You know, so if yes to both of these, then there's some factor between point A and point nine. If no, then some factor greater that's going to increase your premium. Does the company use uh, a third party procedure for, um, or, uh, for operation? So a cloud provider, for instance. Now, this was a little bit before everyone was going into the cloud, but now everyone is. So presumably everyone is, is going to be answering this. Now, it's unclear, of course, whether or not cloud will make you more secure or less secure. That's, that's an outstanding question. Um, but you can see how these how these questions evolve. And so you can just add on and add on as many as you need in order to get at um, the appropriate, appropriate level of resolution, let's say. Now, how they come up with um, these numbers, these multipliers, 0 0.8 to 0 0.9, 0 0.95 to 1, I have no idea. There's never any explanation um, about this at all. Uh, you know, maybe it was, it might have been a room of people um, sitting together and, and you know identifying what they thought were the most important questions and identifying what they thought were reasonable ranges for factors. Um, but I have no idea. And so at the end of the day, how are the premiums calculated? Well, the answer is, so the third party liability base rate, that's 16 and a half thousand. Um, uh, times the limit factor, times retention, times data for classification. And so these, this may represent one or more uh, questions, each of these lines here. And at the end of the day, you come up with a final premium. And that's, that's really all there is to it. And I can send anyone samples of cases. These aren't particularly, um, uh, well, they're, they're not you know, classified information or anything. Um, um, these policies are existing or public record. And so anyone can take a look at it. Now, whether or not you would want to follow this, um, I don't know. But like I said, it's still an outstanding question as far as our industry goes and how to, how to do this best. Okay. Um, uh, let me continue, I, I guess. I'm, again, I'm happy to answer questions, but let me continue and, uh, and we can talk more. So the second part of this is related to the cost of these breaches. So I mentioned that if the costs are big, important, if they are material to the company, then we should really pay attention to them and, and take actions. But if they're not, then we should do something else. So um, at the time, um, you know, these, I'll talk about the data in a second, but as you know, probably unsurprising that data breaches are increasing um, in frequency. Now, this may, of course, been because we had better data collection and better reporting that we're just identifying more cases. But, you know, either way, um, it's still becoming more, more prevalent. Now, I separate data breaches from security incidents and privacy violations um, for a couple of important reasons. Uh, let me describe right here. Um, uh, so what we did for this study was collect a data set from a company called Advisen, um, based in New York here. And um, they are subsequently bought by another company whose name's I, name I forget, um, but they collect lost data, um, operational lost data uh, in many areas, cyber is just one of them, to sell back to either the company companies or to insurance companies. And it's very useful, of course, for doing this kind of analysis. And uh, so, um, so the time span that we are looking at with 2004 to 2014, so over 10,000 of these events that we looked at. And so for our purpose of for this research, we were classifying these events as either data breaches, so unauthorized disclosure information. So in, in, it was either 
accidental or malicious information was was leaked out or was stolen or was dis otherwise disclosed by the company versus privacy violations that are related to un unauthorized collection of information. So this might be GPS or mobile apps or websites collecting information um, inappropriately about customers or users versus security incidents, which are sort of malicious attacks targeted toward the company themselves. Um, uh, so it would be actually be interesting to do the same analysis with current data to see if these trends are changing. I suspect we would see probably more of all of them, um, but maybe a, a, a greater proportion of security incidents where companies actually being hacked, um, especially given ransomware. Um, okay. <clears throat> and so just to give you a kind of a first cut look at um, uh, a very broad look at where the incidents or the rates of these incidents were occurring, uh, services industry, retail, you know, hotels, business services, um, or sorry, uh, the hotel, software, computer services, these service industries were, were most often affected, then followed by finance, insurance, real estate, public administrations, government, state and local and I guess federal government um, agencies, then retail and manufacturing. Um, in our paper, I, and I can share it with anyone, there's more detail about proportions of companies, which industries uh, proportionally are suffering more, we're suffering more of these incidents relative to other companies. And um, anyway, the paper goes into more detail around that and litigation around different, uh, different breaches. And so you know, what we're getting at is what are the costs of these breaches? And so we want to classify these at least in two different ways, the first party and the third party losses. So the first party are all the losses the company incurs themselves directly because of, because of the incident. So we talked about breach notification, forensics, any kinds of consumer notification or consumer redress that the company would have to provide, um, as well as any, in these data sets, any information related to money stolen um, by the company, uh, from the company. And then third party losses, so litigation. So third parties, uh, employees or customers are, um, are mad because of the breach. They wanna bring a lawsuit to recover these losses. All of the defense and settlements is kind of captured by these third party losses. There are lots of costs that are not covered here to be clear, loss of intellectual property um, loss or, or, or you know, copyright or future lost business. Um, is not copied or is not covered here. What people often call reputational loss is not covered here. I think really they just mean stock market prices or sort of again, future revenue or sales, really just sales. That is not kind of ca captured in, in any of this. There is a body of research that looks at the effect of data breaches on stock market prices. If anyone is interested in that, um, I can. I can uh, pass you information there. Are, at this point, there are dozens and dozens of papers. Um, uh, most of them say, look, there isn't a very material effect of this. If there is, it's a short term, but over the long term, there's really no impact. Okay, so the, 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 the big point of all of this is to say, are data breaches expensive? And the answer is, mm, I don't really think so. Um, it seems that yes, there are companies that lose hundreds of millions of dollars um, from these incidents. Um, here in the US, Target, Sony, uh, Equifax is reaching I think, close to a billion dollars in, in losses. And yes, that's a lot. Um, but for most companies, most of the time, their median losses are less than a couple hundred thousand dollars for these data breaches. There's some variation in security incidents and, and privacy violations. I also looked at other kinds of phishing things, but but the real point is that $170,000 that most half of the companies and half of the cases in half of the incidents, companies are losing less than $200,000. Um, now, is that 
you know, what does that mean in, in perspective? How do we put that in perspective for firms and events overall? These are some other kinds of losses, fraud, waste, and abuse from other areas. These aren't my numbers. I collected these from other data sources. So if we think of loss of intellectual property, people have tried to, to make estimates, loss of, of, of kind of property loss from Hurricane Katrina here in the US a number of years ago, cybercrime, insurance fraud, sort of all these other issues. Where does cyber relate to that? Is that a big deal or not? And, and if people are talking about losses in 10 billion of dollars um, annually, I believe, then cyber is sort of sitting kind of down low. As a function of revenue for the firms, um, you know, if we go back to a firm, uh, and executives and boards and their enterprise risk management conversations would want to know, look, if I have a portfolio of risks that I manage from uh, regulatory, tax, supply chain, um, uh, labor, whatever, cyber is just one of those risks. Should I be worried about it? Do I need to be worried about it? Well, the answer is, you know, relative to industry, there's a shrinkage. So a theft from restaurants and loss of, of food and other beverages it's in terms of bad debt, hospital debt, credit card fraud, um, the rest of it, cyber, cyber incidents are less, make up less than a percent of firms' annual revenue. So it was surprising for us to see it so low. Um, I didn't know where it would fall and, 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 and um, uh, related to these others, but it was, it was very startling to see it so low. So again, certainly there are lots of firms that lose hundreds of millions of dollars, but when we look at the full body, the full population of, of losses, um, it's, it's, it's not as quite as grave as, as uh, we would hear in, in the media. Now, um, that being said, uh, things do seem to be changing. So ransomware, as we keep mentioning, as I keep mentioning, uh, seems to have become quite a, a plague um, with thousands of incidents themselves just happening. And some can be quite disastrous and, and very malicious, right? This isn't just some anonymous hacker stealing some anonymous information. Um, these, these would be hackers, you know, hacking into the system, encrypting your information, um, <clears throat> threatening to post it online, you know, if you don't pay. So it's not just a matter of they will release the information, but now they have a copy of it and can still uh, extort you or exploit you in, in some ways. Um, and that's, that's just mean, I think. That's just mean. Um, so what is this meant for, for insurance companies? Before, you know, a number of years ago, when I would talk to them and ask them what the big issues are, they would talk about cloud computing and um, Internet of Things. So now with Internet of Things, our attack surface is growing and growing and growing with all these devices connected to the Internet um, and cloud computing. So now suddenly everyone is moving their enterprise systems to someone else's computer. Um, is that good or bad? We never really knew, but it does represent a point of single failure, a point of aggregate risk. And so this notion of systemic risk really becomes important for carriers who are trying to diversify their portfolio, not for the firms necessarily, but for the insurance companies and the reinsurers for that matter. And so, you know, where are we now? Well, the answer, where are we now? So these are data collected by um, the NAIC, which here in the US is kind of a quasi, not quite a regulator, but they work with regulators and they work with the insurance companies to come up with standards of, of behavior. So they collected data, they uh, issued a data call to cyber insurance carriers here in the US to ask them you know, all kinds of questions. How many policies do you have? Um, uh, how much are the, how much, what is the volume of premiums that you are collecting and what are you paying out? What are you paying out in claims? And so you take the ratio of those two and you have the loss ratio, this middle 
uh, or this second from the right column's loss ratio. So anything over 100% means that you're paying out exactly what you're bringing in, which means you're not making any money effectively. Anything over 100%, well, at 100%, anything over that means you're losing money. So the, for the first time I've seen, and, and maybe other people have other data, and I'd be, I'd be interested to see it. So for the first time, oops, for, ah, for the first time, AIG, which is a monster of a company here in the US with <clears throat> um, an 8% market share, I actually thought it was more than that, had a 100% loss ratio. Uh, CNA, another big company, had 105 loss ratio, and Sampo, which, like I said, I had never heard of, had 114 loss ratio. What is also very interesting is that some of these companies have, have still quite low um, loss ratios, 30%, 25%. So Chubb, so AXA is obviously big now. They had some mergers, you know, very close to 100% too. I should have listed that. Um, Chubb seems to be doing you know, much better, um, you know, they have almost double what their next competitor does. Um, Beasley Axis, uh, 50%, so they're making, you know, a little bit of money. Um, but this is, this is surprising to me, and it's, it's, it's quite shocking. Now, uh, well, I, I can only speculate about, about the actual issues. Um, it could be changes in policies um, themselves. It could be people more more willing or susceptible, better able to identify breaches uh, and more willing to pay the deductible and file the claim. Um, carriers are more happy to, to pay out the claims, but either way, carriers are incurring quite a loss in this. And so as a result, I understand the carriers are, um, are narrowing their coverage. Lloyd's has issued some releases to discourage um, uh, reissuance of, of cyber insurance policies. Um, I don't know how often that happens. If this kind of, if, if these kinds of events occur in other, have occurred in other insurance lines over the past, I, I, I don't know, um, but this seems shocking to me. So uh, <clears throat> that's all I have. Happy to take any questions. You're welcome to email me if, if you want. Um, but I will stop there. Thank you, uh, Sasha, for a very interesting talk with lots of, uh, of information on, on cyber. We, we have some time now for questions from the audience. I uh, don't know if you have some. Do not hesitate to uh, open your microphone and, and speak. We are not many today. So maybe I can start with one question. Yes. So um, uh, just uh, um, come back to the beginning of your talk. So in, in France, we had uh, uh, some information some, uh, about the French market and how uh, companies are insured against uh, cyber risk. And in fact, they show that a large company uh, are well uh, covered. Let's say more than 85% uh, uh, are covered, but uh, small companies uh, did not take a lot of cyber insurance. Is it the same uh, in uh, the US or is the coverage larger or wider in the US? Um, it, that's a good question. That matches my understanding too. I don't, believe, I don't believe it's quite as high as that for the large companies. Um, uh, I don't have the specific numbers. I, I don't know exactly what they are. Um, I can try and dig some up. I think at Bison, again, this company, um, does have more information about that. Um, I had, the latest I had seen is 30, 35 percent. Uh, mm -hmm. But um, I, I don't have better information. I can try and dig some up for you though. Okay, thank you. There is a, there is a legitimate question about what is the appropriate amount mm -hmm. because I've always, you know, I've heard this a number of times that where people would say they're um, uh, the cyber insurance market is, is sort of too young and there isn't enough of it. And so we need more cyber insurance, but no one is able to ever really describe what they mean by an appropriate amount of cyber insurance. Like, I, I don't know what that means really. Um, I, I wish I did. I mean, one argument might be that, look, if we have a hundred percent coverage, then policy holders, or sorry, 
insurance companies can better diversify reducing their risk. So that should drive premiums down, just like with health insurance. Um, but I don't know if that works in a corporate insurance um, um, context. There's another argument to say, well, what we might like is to have 100% coverage of insurable losses. So not all losses for everything, but what is actually insurable. So we want companies to be, we want there to, to exist enough coverage in the market to accommodate all of the losses that could occur because of this. Um, uh, I, I don't know if that's the right way to think about it, but I guess that's another way of describing what, what there could be or should be in terms of coverage. Thank you. Thank you. Another question? Yes, hi everyone. Hi. It's uh, Nabil. Hi. So, thank you for, for the interesting talk. I have a, a simple question. I did not really follow what you said about this uh, security questionnaires. So my, my question is, are they available if we would like to read some examples online or is it very difficult to access? Um, I had to dig through hundreds and hundreds of documents to find these questionnaires. Um, uh, I'm happy to share those that I have with you, if that's what you're looking for. Um, they are available online, but again, you have to dig through. Okay. Some of the some of the big carriers, uh, AIG, Chubb, may have some samples, what they call specimens, available online that might be easily found. Um, I don't know, but but uh, you're welcome to contact me, and, and I can share with you. Yeah. Some thank examples. you very much. Yeah. And you you mentioned uh, in these questionnaires. Uh, the, something about the network. So how are the computers connected together? Mm -hmm. So is it really something that is accessible, that kind of information and used to, to price, for example? Yeah, no, it's great. Most of the time, what I found were the, that the questionnaires were completely separate and independent from the pricing. Now, okay. why is that? That doesn't make sense. If you're going to bother to ask the question, it should factor into the premium somehow. That's the whole point of it, at least from my point of view. Um, but most often that was not the case. Thank you. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So another question maybe? Uh, yes, I have a question. Thank you, Sasha, for, for your very interesting um, analysis of cyber insurance products in the United States. Um, I am wondering um, uh, which covers are, turns out to be the more mature in terms of both wording and pricing. And at the opposite, at the opposite uh, which covers raise more <laughs> issues regarding insurability? Um, I think if I understood, so which of these strategies are you asking was most prevalent? Uh, no, basically I'm asking, uh, um, so in uh, cyber products, you have uh, a lot of different covers that you uh, addressed, such as uh, first liability, uh, business interruption, third liability uh, uh, covers, um, and uh, uh, the economic actors may have different uh, wordings to uh, uh, regarding the coverage in the contracts and regarding the exclusions. Uh -huh. um, so, uh, yes, the question is, what cover are the more mature? That means that all economic actors use the same term to, uh, to, to deal with this coverage in the products. That the opposite in which covers the wordings are extremely different from an insurance to a, to another insurer. Hmm, um, it's a great question. Uh, oh, I don't know if I have the answer. Um, I'm trying to think now. <clears throat> so in our work, we would have documented 
all of these instances that we found. So you can imagine on a, on a table, an Excel table, every row is a policy, every column is an instance of a particular coverage area. So we would have documented, does this policy cover this thing? Yes. Does this policy cover this item? No, 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 no. So we would have numbers for all of the areas that are covered by all policies. Um, and I'm trying to think now if we, if we presented that table in the paper, this research paper is available. I'm, I'm happy to share it. You can download it today. Um, I'm trying to think now if we, if we, um, reported that. Um, if we did, then it, it should be in the paper and you're welcome to take a look. Uh, if we didn't, then uh, maybe send me an email and and I can I can go through. I think I mean I think what you're asking is is business inter income loss covered in 80% of policies and is it always described the same way across the policies? And uh, and uh, it's exactly really regarding the wordings and regarding the pricing uh, is the pricing comparable or very volatile mm -hmm. yes yeah they didn't have they don't have that level of resolution that level of detail so business income loss or business interruption loss was not it was not priced separately from forensic reviews they weren't itemized like that right you're getting a whole kind of package deal um uh, I don't recall there being much variation in the wording. Um, I recall there being fairly good consistency because these policies are generally meant to be standardized. They're not always like that, but you can you would hope that they would be, and uh, because that helps customers and brokers compare across policies and across across carriers, um, and that is done. De deliberately. Um, that being said, there. Hmm. The short answer is I don't recall there being much variation in the wording to the extent that it made the coding difficult. That it was pretty clear what they were talking about. Um, but that might be worth a second look by somebody to go through and 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 do better um, natural language processing on these on this text to see if there were slight variations. That's not okay. a very satisfying answer, I'm, I'm sure. Yes, yes, it, it is, it is. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, the coding was clear, so the wording was uh, not ambiguous. That's... Right, right, we, we didn't run into to many problems that way. Okay, thank you. So another question maybe? So I actually have a few questions uh, beginning uh, with the end uh, when, when you mentioned the, the different loss ratios. Uh, are we confident that the, the losses that we have are uh, complete? What I mean is that uh, you may have some claims that take a significant amount of time to be uh, sold and to be paid and uh, are we sure that we are not missing something uh, because uh, I, I mean you, you there is some uh, data from 2019 probably 2019 it's stable uh, but with 2020 uh, are we completely clear about that because this could also explain maybe the disparities between uh, uh, the loss ratios uh, uh, between companies Yep, you're right. You're right. That could be possible. I I don't know. Um, uh, I don't know to the extent it's possible <clears throat> in the data call when information was asked about premiums written in claims that there was another question about you know the percent of policies that were fully adjudicated mm. or something which might give a measure of how many were still outstanding. I, I don't have any information about that, but you're right. It is possible that that could account for some, although, yeah, and I, I don't have a good sense for how much that would change any of the numbers. If it's just a 10th, a fraction of a percent, or if it could 
represent a lot of it? It's, it's a very good question. And I have another question uh, at the beginning of your part two, when you, you say that uh, the number of uh, data breaches uh, increase, uh, what is the source of your data? Because you, you said also that uh, data collection improved. So uh, do we have a clear vision about the exposure? Uh, I mean, the, the augmentation could be also caused by the fact that we can better detect and then it becomes difficult to separate uh, one effect from another. Yes, yes, you're right. And we're always, we are always concerned about that. Um, these data come from Advisen. Again, the data that I used for this whole analysis. And I believe they, they are, in my opinion, the best, most comprehensive source of breach information. Um, there would still be measurement error stuff that they don't capture because an event is too small, let's say, um, or limited to a small number of, of kind of affected users, but this is the best we have. Um, the, the point about how data collection may be increasing over time related to, um, in the US, we have these breach disclosure laws, again, that require companies to tell you when they suffer an incident, which is largely how we know about all of this. Um, those laws began to be adopted in 2003. California was the first and then generally progressed over time. So 2006, seven, eight, you know, 10, more states are adopting these laws, meaning we're learning about more breaches and more uh, in more states in the country here. So from, let's say, and then by, you know, 2010 or so, effectively most states have these laws now. So what we might, whoops, what we might, the best explanation most conservative explanation is, yeah, the data before, say, 2010 represents, you know, what, you know, some significant part could be just better data collection, better awareness about these incidents. And then data afterwards, by then, I think we've reached an equilibrium. There were a couple states that have had yet to adopt the laws, but for all intents and purposes, um, most states would have adopted it. So the information from say 2010 onward probably reflects the, the true amount or the best that we have. And perhaps the last question uh, in the same spirit, uh, when you are talking about uh, the amount paid by uh, companies uh, regarding cyber events, uh, do you have a, uh, I mean, when, when, you, when you mentioned this number, is it completely clear what a cyber event is? And uh, if you do not find uh, some uh, consequences of cyber uh, events in other uh, losses, that may explain why you have something which is, uh, which is very small compared to other type of, uh, of risk. Sure. So you mean these numbers here? Uh, no, it's, it, it, I think it's a slide just after, or maybe the other one. Yes. Yes, this one. Oh, I see. Yeah. Um, yes, it, it's definitely true. I wasn't, um, I didn't have perfect information. You're right, because cyber crime, uh, sp uh, may, online fraud, you're right, there might be some overlap of information there that's 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 true um uh so i'm i'm not going to sort of promise complete accuracy what i was trying to do is just collect any information i could sort of broad information about um uh, about different kinds of incidents so uh the intellectual property was you know is something kind of different that's that's law that's more like kind of corporate espionage um uh, and, and state-sponsored espionage <clears throat> predominantly from, from China, from what we keep understanding. Uh, and the cyber crime, I'm trying to remember now, related, um, oh, shoot. Uh, I forget now what, what all was, um, what all was accounted for. It might've been mostly financial losses. So thefts of like actual money from, from banks stolen. 
um, as opposed to the cost to firms directly, right? So the, the two situations would be hackers stealing a billion dollars from a bank, like kind of walking in, sort of well, hacking in to steal that, that billion dollars from a bank versus the cyber events that I'm characterizing down below being the loss directly to the company itself, the cost that it would have to incur in order to restore its, its systems. But you're right, I, I agree that there is some overlap there. Um, but I would still argue that there wouldn't be kind of complete overlap that we're not in these, you know, the hundreds of billions of dollars a year. But it's it, it, it's a fair point. This this we don't want this to be terribly misleading to people. Okay. So yeah. th thank you again, Sasha. Uh, very interesting talk. Thank uh, you, Sasha. And, thank you. Uh, thank you all for attending this uh, this uh, working group at uh, an unusual time uh, due to uh, jet flag, uh, not jet flag, but. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I lose the, the world, the correct world. Uh -huh. my, my brain Thank you. is intact. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Thank you again, Sasha. And uh, have a nice afternoon for uh, the audience and uh, a nice, nice morning for nice uh, a nice day for, for you, Sasha. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Merci.